Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. So we're going to talk about the back muscles. Now the back muscles can be described broadly using a term as epaxial. So the epaxial muscles are those which exist posterior to the vertebral column and act upon the vertebral column. These could also be called as the intrinsic spinal muscles. And from your lecture, you would have learned that they are in three groups. We have a superficial layer. We have an intermediate layer. And we have a deep layer. Now, these are just the broad um, variations or um, ways that we distinguish these muscles from one another, whereby the deep mus muscles also have another small group called segmental, but we're only going to look at a couple of very big ones today. So in the superficial group, we're going to have a look at some muscles called the splenius group. And they are broken into two um, categories, effectively via what we call as cervices. This meaning that they are coming and attaching to the cervical vertebrae and capitis. So capitis, if you think about wearing a cap, this is meaning of the head. The intermediate group of muscles, this is our erector spinae. Now our erector spinae, these are important uh, for us to know as they're our chief extensors of the vertebral column and you'll be asked a question about these likely in your exam and your viva exam. The deep layer of muscles, we have a group which is called the transverso spinalis group and it gets its name by the direction that it originates and inserts. So if you think about the positions of the bony prominences on the vertebral column, we have some transverse processes and we have some spinous processes. So we know that its origin will be lateral and its insertion will be medial. And then another group we have we got what we call as a segmental. Now these have names which are respective to where they originate and insert, like intertransversari as an example. So you can imagine that that's going to go between the transverse processes or interspinalis between the transverse processes, uh, spinous processes in this case, but we're not going to speak about those. We're going to look at the splenius muscles, the erector spinae, and then one of the transverso spinalis groups uh, of muscles, and we're going to look at one called multifidus. So what we're going to have a look at now is kind of where they're going to come from and go to. So before we draw them onto our back model here, which you've been given the template in your practical workbook, let's just do a bit of a basic drawing to understand kind of the direction that these uh, are traveling. So here we have the spinous processes along the midline and lateral of that we have the transverse processes. So if we consider that we've got some squares to represent the spinous processes along the midline and then we'll put some circles in to represent the transverse processes which would be existing lateral. So the transverse processes that you can see which are in line, this is one vertebrae here, another, another, etc, etc. If we consider the intermediate group of muscles like the erector spinae, what they do is they originate and insert in such a way that they originate from the midline and travel upwards. So they always travel upwards, these muscles. They don't travel downwards, so they originate lower and they insert up along the vertebral column so that when they act, they can create extension of the vertebral column. So spinous process to transverse process. So the muscle is effectively going to look, you know, just as a basic representation like this on either side. So here we can see that this is the midline so this is the right side of the body and the left side of the body because we're looking at it from uh, the back. 
So viewing it from this view like this. We know about our muscles, the insertion moves towards the origin. So we can draw an arrow to represent the direction of line of pull of the muscle existing here on the right, and an arrow to represent the direction of the line of pull on the muscle on the left. So effectively, if we bring them together toward the midline like this, if you're going to have one muscle pulling on its own, what it can do is it can compress all of the levels and create an action we call as lateral flexion. Another action, if it's contracted on one side or what we use the word as unilaterally, it's going to create a type of rotation. And then if we use both muscles at once, which is a bilateral action, this is extension. So you're using the muscle on the left and the muscle on the right, and it effectively makes a straight line of pull, therefore uh, extending the vertebral column. Let's have a look at this transverso spinalis group then in the opposite light. So this is gonna go from the transverse to the spinous above. It might go up one segment or, or more than one, but realistically, it's just gonna go from the transverse below to the spinous above. So from the transverse below to the spinous above, it's gonna look like this. So same thing we, we, which we just drew before, but you can see that it's now in the opposing direction. Okay, so this is now origin, this is now insertion, whereas before this was origin and this was insertion. If we draw the line of pull in, once again, it's going to pull the insertion toward the origin, so it's pulling out this time instead of in. So if we look at that, that means we're going to have our two action arrows actually going away. So it's going to create the same actions, lateral flexion unilaterally, rotation unilaterally, and extension unilaterally, but what it's going to do is it's going to create rotation in a different direction. So these ones are going to create rotation from lateral to the midline, but these ones are going to create rotation whereby the midline is moving away. So we have two different types of rotation. We call one as ipsy, ipsy lateral, and we have one as contra lateral. So if we have an ipsy lateral type of rotation, this means to the same side. And if we have a contralateral type of rotation, this means to the opposite side. So we have the blue group, which is going to create some ipsilateral type of rotation, whereas the pink group is going to create contralateral types of rotation. So we can see that if we were going to turn left, we would have this group on the left acting and this group on the right acting. So can you see how the arrows are in the same direction? So if we were to rotate around to the left, then this muscle here pulls and this muscle here pulls. So if we have a look at it on the vertebral column, what we can see here is we have transverse process, spinous process. Now we said that if it's a transverse, so a spinalis group of muscle, it's going to go from a transverse process here and it's gonna to go to the spinous process of the bone above. So this is the origin, this is the insertion. Now from there, if this muscle pulls, this bony prominence here will be pulled this way toward the origin, will be pulled away this way. So if this muscle is to contract from here to here, then that's gonna pull that across that way. Now you can see then that this muscle here is living on the right side of the column. So when it pulls this out this way, you can actually notice that it turns the column around to the left. That's our contralateral rotation. Whereas if you look at the ipsilateral rotators in the blue, they went from the spinous process here to the, ver to the transverse process above. So when this pulls, this bony prominence is going to be pulled inward toward the midline, whereby its origin is here and its insertion is here. So the muscle on the left here now will also pull this closer to here. So both of these muscles, the transverso spinale on the right and the erector spinae on the left, will create rotation to the same side. They both pull left. So the contralateral rotators are the transverso spinalis groups 
and muscles like erector spinae, they rotate to the same side, the ipsilateral group. So let's put some of those muscles in. If we're going to put those muscles into here, what we're going to do is we're going to draw some erector spinae on the right, and we're going to draw our multifidus muscle that we discussed here on the left. So let's draw in the one of the erector spinae muscles. So our erector spinae is made up of three muscles. We have iliocostalis, long isthmus, and spinalis. You might see it spelled with an E, you might see it spelled with an I, both are acceptable. And then we have that muscle before, like we said, we had the multifidus, which we're gonna draw on the left side. Now, a good way to remember this, you've got I, L, and S is the first three letters. So you might remember I like standing. It's a good little way to uh, remember the muscles uh, in their name, in the erector spinae. So these are our chief extensors. So when they exist both on the right and on the left, they're going to extend you. You might be able to actually feel these. So if you just um, uh, take your hand to your back and feel the kind of bulk of muscle, which is to the right and the left-hand side of your vertebral column there, that's the erector spinae. So let's put these muscles in. Let's choose um, red for iliocostalis. So you guys can follow along at home. Now, iliocostalis, what is that? Ilio means ilium, so here we see the iliac crest, and costalis is meaning of ribs. So the iliocostalis is going to come from the posterior aspect of the iliac crest and parts of the broad thoracolumbar fascia. It'll then travel upward, whereby its fibers will attach onto the ribs. So those fibers are going to attach onto all 12 ribs all the way to the top. So from there, there's a couple of different sections of the iliocostalis. There's an upper section and there's a lower section, but realistically, just know it all as one. It's going to go all the way from the ilium to the ribs, iliocostalis. So there's the bulk of the muscle fibers which are going to be existing there. In light blue, let's do longissimus. So longissimus comes from the lateral aspect of the sacrum down here, like this. It also comes from that thoracolumbar fascia. And what it does is it travels up and attaches itself to the transverse processes here of the lumbar and thoracic vertebrae. It also attaches here to the rib a little bit. So they, they sort of overlap. It then goes very long in its name, longissimus. It travels very long whereby it has a section which attaches to the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae as well. So we're bringing that all the way up. And then it has some fibers which also go to the skull. So we have a few different parts of the longissimus muscle realistically. So we have longissimus thoracis as an example, and that would go to the thorax. So that's these fibers which go to the region of the ribs. We have longissimus cervicis. They're the fibers which come up here to the cervical uh, vertebrae. And then we have longissimus, yep, you guessed it, capitis. And that's because it goes all the way to the skull. So we said that capitis before is to do with the head. So that's longissimus. Now spinalis is a little bit different. What it does is it attaches from spinous process to spinous process. So from the upper lumbar vertebrae, It'll go from here, and its fiber goes very long, all the way up. Let's take it up here, okay, as an example. Then, from the next spinous process above, that one will go all the way to the next spinous process down. So see how it's going shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter as it comes in? So that next one's gonna come up and go to there, and this pattern, follows all the way. So let's just put some spinous processes down here on the side of the page, okay? Whereby what we'll have is we have the fibers from there to there, the fibers from there to there, and the fibers from there to there. So that's the way that it's working, but it's not individual little muscle fibers, it's all one 
uh, big muscle. Okay, so if you wanted to color that in, you could do that also. All right, so that's how that one there sits. So we have the three of them, iliocostalis, longissimus, and spinalis. Now they're those muscles there. Let's put in the multifidus muscle. So our multifidus muscle is that transverso spinalis group. So what it does is it also comes from the sacrum on its median and its lateral surfaces just here. It then sends its fibers upward to the transverse processes and then from there starts to make its way up from the transverse to the spinous. From the transverse to the spinous. From the transverse to the spinous. So can you see that this one is coming up not in a lateral to medial direction but in a, oh, sorry, not in a um, in a medial to lateral direction but a lateral to medial direction. So that's why its fibers are going to create a different action. So that's our multifidus. Now this isn't what, like we're showing here, individual little muscle fibers. This is a very big thick muscle. Now it's gonna be largest in the lumbar region because it's there to support the vertebral column and give us structural um, support as well as controlling the way that your back moves. But let's just take it the whole way up following those that fiber direction of transverse to spinous. So there's our multifidus muscle. This is a contralateral rotator, and these ones are ipsilateral rotators. Now, if we're wondering about the splenius muscle that we spoke about before, splenius capitis and splenius cervicis, well, what they do is they come from the spinous processes of things like T1 through T4. All right, and then from there, its fibers, this is splenius capitis, its fibers travel upward to the side of the skull. Now, this is actually a very superficial muscle, so it's gonna be covering a lot of the muscles which we've just drawn before. So unfortunately, we're covering a few over a few things, but I think you should be able to work it out. Now, what you can see here is this one originates medially and goes laterally again. So it follows the same um, direction of the fibers as the erector spinae. So we know that this one's going to create lateral flexion, so the head will come down this way. Lateral flexion to the left, because that muscle's on the left. It's also going to create rotation to the left because of the way that it comes. And if you had both, then it would create extension of the neck too. Now these muscles here are all innervated by a very basic set of nerves. So the way that this works is if we know that we have the spinal cord, and we know that how we've discussed this before is we have that dorsal root, the ventral root, and that ganglion which exists there, then we are need to be making the spinal nerve. Now beyond the spinal nerve, there's a bridge or a little road that goes to the back of the body and a bridge that goes to the front of the body too. So we call this part here the dorsal ramus. And this one here, the ventral, which means to the front. You might also uh, want to use words like posterior and anterior. That would be okay also. So these ventral ramus, they go to supply pretty much everything on your body except for the back. So the back of your body is done by the dorsal ramus. So these muscles here are innervated by the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves in the regions of the muscles. So if you're ever asked a question about how to uh, give the innovation to these muscles, you may just use the term uh, dorsal ramus because all of them are innovated by the same thing.